All right. I think we're going to get started. Uh, if there's anyone else, they'll trickle in. We're going to do some um, housekeeping to start with. So hopefully they won't miss too much. Uh, so thank you everyone for joining uh, us this morning at the Soil Health Institute. Um, this is the first of our five webinar session for Soil Health for Pacific North Potatoes. I'm Catherine East. Hi, I'm the Soil Health Educator on this project. Um, so I'll be doing this webinar series um, and I'm excited to be talking about soil health with uh, with all of you today. So this is session one. Session one really is what is soil health? Uh, and we have a, a number of sessions to follow, but that's where we're gonna start. Um, so for the webinar format, this is gonna be hopefully about a 40 to 45 minute pr presentation followed by any Q and A. This is a webinar, so uh, we don't have any, you know, voice to voice or face to face interaction unfortunately, but please ask any questions that you have in the Q&A. Uh, I think there's also the webinar chat, but, but uh, try to put it in the Q&A if it's a question specifically. You can upvote questions in the Q&A that you think are interesting and would like answered first. Um, and then the webinars will be recorded. This is being recorded right now, and it'll be available later. So if you want to return to anything, um, there, that will be an option. So like I said, I'm from the Soil Health Institute. The Soil Health Institute is a global nonprofit with a mission of safeguarding and enhancing the vitality and productivity of soils through scientific research and advancement. Um, this is a picture of our website here that we've got a whole bunch of information uh, about us. At the Soil Health Institute, uh, we do quite a few different things uh, across North America and many different uh, crop commodities. Potatoes is just one of them. Um, and we have a pretty big team of educators and scientists, economists, um, and any number of other people um, all invested in the, our, our mission um, with the Soil Health Institute. So we're, we're happy to be a part of this project that's bringing you this educational session. So the project we're a part of is the Climate Smart Potatoes from the Pacific Northwest. This is a Climate Smart grant. It's a five-year, $50 million grant. Um, and as part of this project, um, there's this um, potato soil health educational series, as well as uh, the main thrust of the project, excuse me, is to provide incentive payments for adoption of climate smart practices in Pacific Northwest potato rotations, um, as well as on tribal nation land, but specifically for the purpose of this webinar um, are, is on potato. And this can be existing practices or new practices. Uh, both of them can be paid, and then this can also be for the non-potato years as part of the rotation. So it doesn't just have to be uh, while potatoes are being grown. It can be in the other parts of the potato rotation. So that's part of what we are a part of. Um, as far as the training session agenda goes, so today is session one, what is soil health? Um, and then uh, the second Friday of every month from here on out, uh, we'll be doing a different one until... Let's see, it's February, March, April, May, June until June. Um, and so the next session will be, we'll talk about uh, greenhouse gas modeling and carbon sequestration models. And I'll show some of the, um, some scenarios that explain um, kind of how much greenhouse gas emissions and uh, carbon sequestration we might expect based on, on different models um, in the potato system with different rotations or, or climate smart practices. Um, Session three, I'm going to talk mostly about how we measure soil health. And so that's, you know, what kind of measurements we make, uh, the indicators that uh, that exist and that SHI recommends, and different soil health tests. So like the Haney test, for example, that's just one of the many uh, different suites of soil health tests that exist. Um, and we'll talk about, uh, we'll talk about all of those and kind of how they fit in. And then we're also session four, we'll talk about scaling soil health. So um, instead of just soil health on a per field or per farm basis, really looking at how do we scale soil health across a production system or across a landscape that might vary in soil types and in uh, climate. Um, and then session five is TBD. So we could, um, I, I'm, I'm open to suggestions. I know as we go through these sessions, um, topics might come up and I, I'm, I'm very interested in um, providing to you what the education you would like, feel free to email me. Um, if you have a suggestion for something as we keep going on, uh, we could talk about the economics of soil health. We could talk about pests and pathogens specifically, um, you know, whatever, whatever kinds of things you think of. And if you don't think of something, I'll think of something. So, but we got a lot of time before we get that far. 
<clears throat> excuse me. So we did a listening session. Many of you were, were a part of that. Um, trying to get a, a, a feel for what the Pacific Northwest potato system is like um, and how soil health fits into this. Um, and so there's some key themes we got out of out of those sessions. So some of them were were challenges and opportunities, right? So what challenges do we see with soil health practices adoption in the potato system? You can see in these these graphs of responses here, uh, there's a lot of logistical challenges. Excuse me, rented versus owned land is a uh, seems like a pretty big sticking point for for some of these practices. Um, implementing practices in different potato regions, the PNW is a big region with lots of climate differences. Um, the different areas of potato production are very different. So, uh, you know, implementing uh, those practices in those ways, um, correlations between indicators and soil function um, is maybe not all that clear. But then there's also, how do we see soil health practices aiding potato farming? And there's a lot of uh, really positive feedback on this as far as stewardship, whether that's environmental stewardship or um, agricultural stewardship, uh, controlling erosion control, um, nutrient management, uh, climate or drought resilience, improved water use efficiency, nutrient management, all of these things. And so, um, you know, there's a lot of challenges, there's lots of opportunities. So we'll talk about many of those today and, and as we continue on. So let's get into it. So what is soil health? Uh, it's a good question to start with when we're talking about the soil health for PNW potatoes. So I have some learning goals. This was mostly to define this for, for me, but also hopefully for you. So we're going to define soil health, regenerative agriculture, and sustainable agriculture um, uh, to understand the functions of soil. Um, what are the four principles of soil health? So how do we think about, um, when we think about management or we think about uh, agriculture, how do we think about soil health? And then how these principles can be used to support production goals. So soil health um, is a term that really emerged from soil quality in the 1990s. So before, you know, before the 1990s, this word soil health was not a thing, right? That That's not in any of the literature. And it really took off in the early 2000s. And um, it, it's it's from the idea that um, soil health is, soil is a living system, right? So can a living system be healthy? Um, and so quality is more is less about it being a living system and maybe about just the, the particulars, uh, chemical or physical qualities of the soil. So soil health is related to soil fertility, soil quality, and soil security. But because of its uh, the particular nature, there's a lot of challenges associated with you know quantitatively assessing it. How do you measure soil health? Um, and so that's something that uh, we're every, we're continuously working on. You know what is the best way to do it in different scenarios. And so this uh, this word map I have here is really, I asked the question in the listening sessions, what is soil health? And so I took uh, some people's answers and said, all right, what are what are some of the the big overarching themes I'm seeing? And so I, I think this is pretty illuminating, uh, ambiguous, right? Uh, when I know the first time I heard soil health, I'm like, I don't know what that means. Um, you know, what is, what makes that soil healthy? It's very regional. Uh, definitely. I think there's a lot of regionality to, to the term. Um, though the principles I think remain the same. It's associated with productive soils, soil function and the efficiency of agriculture. I think that that all makes sense. And then this negative connotation, I think mostly comes from, uh, the, when we talk about soil health, uh, you know, there can be the perception that we're saying, um, uh, farmers or the people who are, you know, where soil health practices would be put into place are not doing a good job. Uh, and, and I think that's, that's not a, not a very helpful perspective, right? We're, we're not here saying, oh, you're doing a bad job. You know, you need to improve your soil health. I think there's, it's, it's definitely a spectrum, um, that we are, we are trying to progress along. Um, so just, it, this was really uh, illuminating for me when, when I was starting to build this presentation and we're thinking about what is soil health. So we have a soil health definition, um, uh, SHI, we use the same definition as the USDA and RCS and many other people. And that's the continued capacity of the soil to function as a vital living ecosystem that sustains plants, animals, and humans. Uh, and there's really, I think three, I've only highlighted two here, whoops. But there's three uh, pieces of that that's really um, 
key to this definition. One is that the soil needs to function. Um, so we relate soil health back to the functions of the soil. And then it's a living ecosystem. So it's right, this is not inert. There is biology, there is all sorts of processes happening in the soil um, that are uh, supported by this living ecosystem and help support that ecosystem. And then the continued capacity, which I haven't highlighted here, but that's really that um, this needs to persist as, as we continue to occupy the space and, and use uh, the soil for agriculture. We need to, that needs to keep going into the future. So keeping that going. Uh, there's there's three pillars really of uh, qualities that we think of when we think of healthy soil. Um, so these involve, like I said, the physical and, and the chemical uh, components. So physical components are things that affect rooting depth, uh, water movement and storage, movement of gases, and soil biology, right? Like uh, different soil biota need different pore spaces to move in or aggregates that they can uh, occupy, um, things like that. And then uh, chemical components, these affect nutrient transformations and the distribution of nutrients through the soil, uh, which we which we know is really important for agriculture, right? And then uh, the biological capacity, it affects the capacity to store and provides nutrients for biology. And so the intersection of all three of these things is really where uh, soil health um, exists. So uh, soil health versus regeneration or regenerative ag. Soil health is really focused on regenerating the soil, right, to improve its functionality by implementing these soil health promoting principles, which we'll get to. Uh, so when we, you know, these terms kind of overlap in a lot of ways. Regenerative ag is really a way of farming that focuses on soil health and focuses really, I mean, on all those components of the definition, but really that continued capacity, right? It's regenerating it uh, to have that capacity. Sustainable agriculture overlaps with regen and um, soil health, uh, but has a couple of other things that are really involved in Um right? Sustainability involves economic viability, community uh, sustainability, environmental sustainability. Uh, so regenerative ag agriculture is a part of sustainable agriculture. As far as the functions of healthy soil goes, um, healthy soils, generally speaking, excuse me, are very highly productive. They have high organic matter or organic carbon, relatively um, higher, a higher water holding capacity, uh, water infiltration, drainage, um, generally a lower population of plant pathogens and pests, uh, minimal erosion, and are highly resilient so to extreme uh, like extreme weather or like water events. And keep in mind that all of these, when I say these functions of healthy soils, are relative, right? So this relative to the local climate, the local soils, and the production system, um, which we'll talk about more in session four when we talk about benchmarking. But um, if we look at these just purely as numbers uh, across the board, across North America, um, the Pacific Northwest, right, is an arid irrigated system. So it's going to have very different numerical values for some of the things we measure as indicators for whether a soil is healthy or not compared to, say, you know, Midwestern soils. So just as an example of regional variation, uh, these two pictures, one is... Um, and these are from Texas, which is also, you know, an arid western state. So this is the one on the left is uh, non-irrigated dryland wheat, and then one on the right is irrigated wheat. And so you can see just just looking at this field, just the difference in water availability or irrigation is going to make a huge difference in the amount of biomass you're producing, and also in the amount of uh, by lo logically the amount of organic carbon that's going to be there. So like in the Pacific Northwest, an irrigated system is going to have naturally more organic carbon than, say, the uh, the native system, just because there's water on it. So that's something we need to keep in mind when we're looking at indicators and looking at these numbers and comparisons is that uh, the water makes a really big difference in this system. And so just as a, another example with some graphs, uh, these are from uh, our dairy project. And so, you know, Wisconsin are these two, New York, Idaho, and then Texas and New Mexico. And these are some of the indicators we use for soil health. Uh, we'll talk about more detail in a different session, but you can see the values um, are really different between these areas. Um, and that's just inherent to the climate that they're under um, and the soils that they're from. 
So they can be changed, but they have to be changed, you know, relative to where they exist. So, you know, <laughs> I hope that makes sense. Um, so let's talk about soil function. Uh, that was that that second big point in um, in the soil health definition. So soil has got a number of functions. Uh, one of them is regulating water. So soil helps regulate where uh, where rain, snow melts, or irrigation water goes. Um, so things like pore spacing, um, texture is a component of this. If there are soil aggregates, that will help control where water goes, um, uh, where there are roots. That will be a part of this. So water regulation, is it, is it ponding? Is it passing through? Is it being retained in the soil? That's a, those are pretty important soil function. Uh, one of them is sustaining life. That, that one's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, um, we, uh, we need soil to produce, to do, produce plants, to feed animals, to provide habitat. Um, so also buffers uh, pollutants. So it can slow nitrogen or phosphate or pesticide contamination of water. Um, so different soil biota can transport pollutants to less harmful compounds. And then soil organic matter can retain heavy metals or other toxins. So this is another uh, essential function um, that soil provides. Uh, one, of the, another, one of the big ones, I mean, they're all big ones, but one of them is a nutrient cycling. So soil is uh, an important component of the carbon and nitrogen and phosphorus cycles um, and provide space for the biology that is part of these cycles and the chemistry that helps um, regulate these nutrients. And then finally, physical stability and support, right? So this uh, soil is a medium for plant roots um, to provide them support as well as support for human structures. Um, and all of these, when they are working um, as they should be, or really well um, uh, support all of these things. So anything that impacts soil function, like say physical stability, um, a breakdown of soil structure, you know, you have, uh, it's muddy or you, you ever try to drive a, a truck onto like a really wet field uh, and you get stuck in the mud. The, those are all, these are all really important soil functions. So what influences um, these soil functions? So there's different um, categories of, of soil properties. So some of them are inherent, right? So they form over thousands of years um, and they're dependent on soil forming factors that changes happen are really minor over time. So this involve, this is things like climate, which uh, talked about a little bit previously, but parent material, topography, uh, the soil biota, and then just time. And the, these are the soil forming properties. Um, so these affect things like texture, right? So percent sand, silt, clay, uh, those are inherent properties of the soil, uh, soil depth, so slope, and the mineralogy. So all of these things are really difficult to change, right? Um, or difficult for us to change in the time span that we have. Uh, we also have dynamic properties, and these are things that can be changed over a much shorter time scale on the scale of, of years to centuries. Uh, and these include things like uh, soil aggregation, soil compaction, uh, water infiltration, and water holding capacity. So uh, these are things that we can change through how we interact with the soil or through management. Uh, and soil health really exists uh, and is affected mostly by these dy uh, by these dynamic properties. Um, Whereas soil quality could be said to have both of these properties are, are really a part of soil quality, right? When we talk about inherent. Um, so how does management change soil health? So when we talk about uh, soil health, we have these so four soil health management principles um, that we keep in mind. And um, they're all right. They're all on a scale. So they're, it's minimizing disturbance, maximizing living roots. We want to maximize soil cover and maximize biodiversity. And what minimize and maximize might mean in any system uh, could be different, right? For for what's what we can do in the system, but it's moving towards uh, these directions. So maximizing living roots, we'll start here. Uh, here's some of the things that 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 imparts to uh, as far as soil health and and these dynamic properties of soil. So tap roots and fibrous roots contribute to soil structure. You can see in this picture here, there's a lot of roots. Um, holding this soil structure together, you can see like very nice aggregation in it. Root biomass uh, is important, a source of soil carbon, um, increased rhizosphere activity, right? The soil that's um, right on the right on the outside uh, of 
plant roots. That's a place of really high biological activity. That's where the plant interacts with um, with the soil, so microbes. So there's a lot of lot of happening there. Uh, living roots protect and provide food sources for soil microorganisms. Uh, they also scavenge nutrients, so um, nutrients that might otherwise be lost, like um, uh, nitrogen that could be leached out of the system or lost to the atmosphere, uh, could be scavenged by these plants and kept uh, kept in the soil or kept in the system. Uh, they provide carbon to build organic matter, and they can help improve water infiltration through these root channels. Um, Here's just I have just more pictures of roots. You can see all their little root hair. So there's a lot of there's a lot of space for um, uh, soil biology and the rhizosphere to to have this activity. So um, these, there's some nodulation on here. So direct interactions with some of these uh, nitrogen fixing bacteria. So there's a lot happening um, in the soil when we have when we maximize the amount of living roots that are there, either spatially, so at at one point or over time. Minimizing disturbance, that's another one of our um, soil health principles. Um, so minimizing disturbance protects habitat and increases diversity in soil organisms because the, their habitat's not being disrupted or it's not being torn up or changed um, very quickly. It helps maintain soil aggregates. Um, disrupting, disturbing soil can disrupt soil aggregation, uh, which is a really important for, uh, for water infiltration and for uh, Pore spacing and, and places for the soil biology to uh, to live and, and do its business, uh, and helps prevent weed seed germination or establishment. Um, and that the, these weed seeds can be covered or not brought up to the surface. Um, crop residue uh, is converted to soil carbon um, as opposed to lost into the atmosphere or yeah recycled very quickly. Uh, water is captured and stored better when the soil is not disturbed, and it reduces erosion by water or by wind. Um, especially uh, in many places in the PNW, they're very it's it's windy. the soil The soil is um, coarse or loose, so there's a lot of chance of erosion. Um, maximizing soil cover. That's another one of our uh, another one of our principles. So that's just keeping. The soil covered. Uh, it's, it's exactly what it sounds like. Um, so here in this picture, you can uh, see. I'm not entirely sure what that plant is, but uh, the soil is covered here by um, by a straw. So this helps prevent erosion. You know, when uh, water is not directly impacting the soil, um, wind has to, it isn't pulling the soil right off the top. It helps moderate soil temperatures. So uh, that's really important for getting in a field early in the season. Um, and also not stressing uh, the soil biology. It's it's a really hot, uh, right in um, uh, in eastern Washington in Idaho. Uh, they can be really hot in the summer and really cold in the winter. So these are uh, are really good to help maintain that soil biology. Um, it helps reduce evaporation. Uh, can help reduce compaction from machines or livestock. Um, if you especially if you're grazing. Uh, there's food for microbes, uh, similar to having uh, living roots. It helps fuel the nutrient cycle and also provides carbon to build organic matter, right? And so you're, we're hearing a lot of these things over and over again because uh, many of these are related, but it's it's easy to package them into these four uh, principles. And finally, maximizing diversity. Um, so maximizing diversity uh, helps build resilience. Um, there's many different, uh, for example, in this case, there's many different uh, plant species. You can see in this picture in the bottom, there's like many different, um, there's differences in rooting depth, there's differences in what kinds of roots there are. And so that helps uh, feed a more diverse uh, cast of uh, soil biology that might help manage pests and diseases. If you think of it um, like um, adding something that's resistant to a particular pest or um, or, uh, is, you know, not susceptible. Um, and integrating livestock is also, here's a picture of some cows, um, foraging. And so integrating livestock is also a way to maximize, uh, the amount of diversity that you have in any piece of land. So those are the four principles. And so let's talk now, now that we've kind of got that framed out, let's talk a little bit about what the challenges 
are associated with these in, in Pacific Northwest potato production because uh, these principles can be applied across uh, pretty much any agricultural landscape, but but every system has its own things that we need to think about um, when we think about implementation. So potatoes are a highly, uh, highly disturbed uh, system, right? They, they need to be dug up out of the ground. So there's just a lot of disturbance inherent in the system. Um, so uh, given that one of the principles is minimize disturbance, how do we go about minimizing that? Um, and can we? Uh, potatoes also leave very minimal residues compared to some other crops. Um, so keeping cover uh, can be difficult. So we could talk, we'll talk about uh, what ways we might be able to address that. Um, soilborne pathogens and fumigation are uh, a really critical component of potato production. Um, and uh, so we'll we'll get into to that as well. You know, how do we address this with with soil health? Um, rotation length is going to be uh, is a challenge as well because many of these um, many of these principles, um, you know, with the more times potato is in the system, the more potential disturbance there is. Uh, water use efficiency. Um, this is a region where everything is irrigated, and the amount of irrigation that you have access to, the amount of water you have access to might be limited. Um, and so implementing some of these things, like say cover crops might be more difficult. Uh, soil erosion is an issue in uh, the Pacific Northwest, um, I think primarily by wind, but also by uh, by irrigation. And I am sure there are others. Uh, these are just the ones that that I we came up with after the listening sessions and doing some some research. And I, you know, if you would like to put some other things in in the Q and A or in the chat um, that you think are challenges that with soil health, I'd be interested to hear them. Um, so feel free. But let's walk through some of these challenges and how we might address them um, with soil health. So a lot of the the climate smart practices or soil health management systems. Uh, that I'm going to talk about, a lot of them are already in use to some degree in Pacific Northwest potatoes, right? So none of these things are, and none of these practices are are really new. We're just, you know, thinking about them and using them in, um, especially for things like climate smart. So a climate smart practice, these in, uh, and these include soil health practices, but they also um, really include nitrogen management or nutrient management. And the goal of these climate smart practices is to reduce greenhouse gases. Um, uh, there, if you know of conservation practice standards, it's pretty much the same thing. It's it's very much a rebranding um, of some of the standards that already exist. So none of these, again, none of these are new. Um, and then soil health management systems is another way of, of talking about these climate smart practices, specifically the ones for soil health. So let me just show you. So this is from the USDA NRCS. This is their climate smart agriculture and mitigation activities list. Uh, you can see there's mitigation categories. These ones are for soil health. There's a number of other ones. I just am showing some of them uh, for context and the conservation practice standard names um, and then what activities would be associated with that. And so for this project, um, these would be the kind of, if if we were going to be uh, looking for these incentives and these adoptions, these are the kind of practice standards um, that uh, this grant is looking for. Um, so these include things like crop rotation. So uh, here we have conservation crop rotation. So something that would improve soil health for that or perennial grain crops, something. Uh, residue and tillage management, cover cropping, mulching, strip cropping, nutrient management, all of these fall under the soil health management systems or climate smart agriculture. Um, so let's talk, let's just walk through all of the, all of the challenges for potato production that I, that I listed earlier. Um, one of them is soil disturbance, right? Like I said, potato systems, as we all know, are a highly disturbed system. Um, but there are, I think there are places where we can reduce that soil disturbance, right? We're trying to uh, minimize disturbance, that doesn't mean zero disturbance. So uh, one of those ways might be physical, right? So at any point that we can reduce tillage, um, whether that be in the potato year or outside of the potato year on the same uh, piece of land, um, both are, are great for improving soil health. Um, that might be fewer passes or using an implement that is of lower intensity. So 
a reduced till or no till, especially not for potato, probably. But say if you're in like a, if you're rotating with corn, if you have control over that part of the rotation, um, something that has a lower intensity or fewer passes. So these pictures here are from Eastern Washington. And really the only difference in these pictures um, is the fact that they have, they have reduced the number of um, tillage passes from, I think, seven to three. So this one has three and this one has seven. And so you can see the difference in soil structure, um, erodibility. Uh, this one here at the top looks like it, it could fly away pretty easily. Um, and I'm guessing also water infiltration, looking at these pictures. Uh, rotation is also a way that we can maybe reduce uh, the amount of soil disturbance that's in the system. Um, rotation length. Uh, so, I mean, the longer periods between highly disturbed crops, the less disturbance you're going to see in the system altogether. That might not be economically feasible. Um, and we also might not know exactly what the right, um, sorry, the right op to optimize that rotation length might be, um, whether there's a, tr like, whether having more soil health practices or reducing this rotation, or sorry, reducing disturbance is going to uh, increase the quality of the, of the, you know, the potato year so much that it makes up for it. I don't think we have a really good handle on that, but there's there's potential for that. Um, also using rotational crops that have less tillage or very little tillage. So something like alfalfa, which is a perennial crop, um, there's less tillage, it requires less uh, nitrogen application. So those, those things can help reduce soil disturbance. Um, adding a cover crop can help reduce erosion, right, from wind and water. Um, it increases uh, that um, living roots in the system. There, that might add a tillage event, so there's a balance there. Uh, but you could uh, mitigate it, something like adding a cover crop at fall hilling in the same pass, or working to combine passes. Um, you know, it's really going to depend on on what uh, you, your current management looks like. Uh, oh, here's a picture. So this is this is not a, a potato field. This is a, a vineyard that's being planted, but this was deep ripped about four times. Um, and so you can see that 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 soil is just absolutely leaving the field because um, it's not covered in any way um, and it's highly disturbed. So I thought that was an, uh, a pretty good example of, of that. Um, there's other forms of soil disturbance, right? It's not just physical. You can have chemical soil disturbance, and that includes things like fertilizers. So excess fertilizer, fertilizer that's not being taken up by uh, by your plant, or uh, soil fumigants, that's another type of chemical disturbance, but these are vital to production, right? So we just need to hone them in as best we can. Um, so anything that reduces lost nitrogen uh, in the system or keeps nitrogen in the system is going to reduce the amount of greenhouse gas emissions uh, that you're having, and as well as, you know, probably save money, ultimately. Um, so uh, that might include things like precision application, um, divvying up a field where, you know, it might need higher, higher nitrogen requirements and, and a different part where it has lower nitrogen requirements, uh, following the four, uh, the four R's. So that's right source, right rate, the right time and the right place. So mostly making sure that nitrogen or other uh, nutrients are getting exactly where they need when they need to be. So they're not being, uh, not, not being lost, right? That they're not being wasted through the system. And then also to going through and disturbing other aspects of the system you don't want them to be. Um, tillage timing is really important as well, right? If, you, if there's tillage happening uh, that can disrupt where these chemicals are going, um, cover crops can scavenge nutrients that might otherwise be lost, maintaining them in the system, and that can help feed the soil biota. Um, and then the question of fumigants and pesticides. So those are also chemical disturbances, right? They they very they can really affect uh, the soil biology. That's what I mean. That's what they're designed to do, um, to at least some degree. So um, when we look at think about pests and diseases, fumigants. Uh, and and pesticides, but especially if especially fumigants because they have a tendency they are more general. Many of them, um, the newer some of the newer pesticides, right, are really specific. So there's less chance of an off-target um, disruption, but they do disrupt the soil biology, um, and it takes time for that soil biology to to build up again. And um, it it can be difficult to 
get the same kind of diversity um, without some other is without some other kinds of inputs. So reducing the frequency of these uh, applications, um, you know, and any reduction in frequency um, it, it would be is good for soil health. It's good for the soil biology. Um, adding green manures or compost. So there's some evidence that green manures can improve net returns compared to fumigation. Uh, that, but that can be inconsistent. So I think that's, uh, you know, that's really, that's really cool, really interesting, but it would be something that would require maybe some testing. Uh, composts, we know that some composts can help suppress disease, but again, it's, they're going to be more variable than like, say, a fumigant. Um, so, you know, they're, these are not like necessarily the easiest things to implement, but they are, they will, they do work. Um, and then rotation. So adding uh, rotational crops that we know are resistant to whatever pathogens we have, um, using, you know, good IPM practices, knowing what diseases you have and what the what the risk levels are for those, knowing the, the numbers of them, th those will help you make these decisions, right? Um, so cover crops or uh, cash crops in rotation can help reduce pathogens and diseases. And Having a really diverse rotation might also help uh, keeping the uh, diversity, right? That's that fourth principle, the diversity of um, the soil biology, and then having different things for uh, different organisms to feed off of uh, might also help balance um, balance pests and diseases. Uh, water, that was pretty important. I I know. Um, so this, this graph here is a graph from... Um, we have a, a, a petotransfer function. So it essentially set, is showing that increasing soil organic carbon, you increase the capacity uh, of a soil to hold plant available water. Um, and that remains true for um, for all of these all of these textures, depending, it changes depending on the texture, but that remains true um, that we have more uh, available water when we have more soil organic carbon. So anything that will improve soil organic carbon so something like cover crops uh, will, or adding um, a mulch or or compost will. Um, adding a cover crop it does use water, right? So there's there's going to be a trade off there, and balancing that and figuring out if that's uh, possible, or what kind of species or what kind of timing is going to be is really regional, I think. Um, so uh, that might take a little more expertise. Um, a little more practice and then reducing tillage is going to help maintain soil aggregates and soil structure that um, is associated with maintaining organic carbon and this water uh, holding capacity. And so we also with uh, improving infiltration and holding capacity, there's less nutrient loss to run off. So there's all of the, yeah, again, all of these things are, are interconnected. Um, just as an example, this, this soil on the left is, is covered and this on the right isn't. And so over here, the water infiltrates just fine. And in this example, uh, there's a lot of ponding and pooling and then sealing happening on the surface of, the, of this soil. Um, and I think it, it's important to remember when we're, we're talking about soil health principles, these things tend to change very slowly. Um, and small changes are okay, right? So there's a lot of overlap in how these soil health management systems can contribute to better production, especially when we keep you know, the soil health func soil functions and the soil health principles in mind. You know, what are your goals when you are adopting these practices? Uh, what are you trying to address? Maybe uh, it's uh, soil structure, maybe it's water, maybe it's nutrient cycling. Um, and those can help guide you on, on what sorts of changes might be um, might be the most appropriate or might, might fit in, in your system. Um, and it takes time and experience to get the most benefits. Uh, there's, is you know, it's, making small changes, inc incremental changes, just seeing how they work, um, uh, speaking with people who've done a lot of these, uh, added these practices to their system, especially in your region. Um, all of those things are, are going to be integral to making soil health changes. Um, and they're going to be, they're probably going to be relatively slow. It's going to take time. Um, so as a recap, there's a lot of text on this slide. So I'm gonna skip to the next one. Same slide, this one's just pictures though. So uh, soil health is really, uh, the definition of it is really maintaining soil function as a living ecosystem, right? And so these are the, these these functions of soil are influenced by, you know, the inherent soil properties. 
you know, uh, of, you know, of climate, topography, those are things that we can't really change, but we can change some of these dy dynamic management properties um, by using these soil health principles and thinking about them when we're implementing uh, these climate smart or soil health management systems. Um, and these are just some examples of practices. There's many, uh, many different ones, but, you know, reducing tillage, changing rotation, whether it's wet crops or or the length of rotation change, nutrient management, cover cropping. Um, so all of these contribute to our soil health management systems that can contribute to improving uh, soil function um, through soil health. And I hope that was informative. Um, and I'm very happy to take any questions that people have. I see there is one. Um, from Dave, and it uh, says another issue in potato production is nitrogen timing release at the wrong time. Uh, absolutely, right? Like that's um, I mentioned it in the earlier on. If we have nitrogen that's being released at a time when the potato plants aren't taking it up, that nitrogen is just lost, and that also contributes to uh, higher greenhouse gas emissions. Potentially, you know, nitrogen. Well, it's lost money first of all, <laughs> but also all these other aspects. And it's also um, lost in the system. Um, are there, you know, are there any other questions, comments? Unfortunately, we just have the the tech, the question and answer and chat feature, but I, I'd be interested to, to see, uh, see what any of you thought. Um, this is the first time we've given this, I've given this webinar. So uh, if you have any comments, um, things you that uh, you would like to see or improve, you know, feel free to let me know. I'm open to suggestions. Uh, I want this, the, the purpose of the series is to be as helpful as uh, we can be uh, for you. And so if uh, we want to make sure you're getting what you, what you need out of it, um, as well as, you know, if you have suggestions for that fifth uh, webinar, uh, please let me know. I'm I'm happy to accommodate what people want to talk about. I'll, I'll stop sharing, mostly because I can't see what time it is. All right, question from Jolyn. Regarding your comment about biodiversity return after fumigation, do you have a reference for how long it will take to return? I, Off the top of my head, I do not. But I know there are references for this. Um, so I will look into that, and then I will have a good answer for you. I, I can give an example from a different system, specifically for root knot nematode. That's where I worked before um, in grape. So I know that after fumigation, it took about a, a year for those to return to where they were, but I don't know for the rest of the soil biology. And it was really dependent on what nematode species you were looking at to whether they returned. But for more biodiversity, I will look into some more references. Thanks for the question. I'm happy to answer. Well, I don't want to rush anyone because I know typing can be slow. Um, but if there are no other questions folks want to ask live, um, I think we can probably end this webinar for today. Ooh, 10 minutes early. Get a little bit more of your Friday morning back. Um, so I believe it, there will be a, a survey sent out after this webinar. Um, I would appreciate if you if you take that. It might not be sent out immediately. Um or, and if, again, if you have any comments or uh, other questions, 
please feel free to email me, uh, keyeast at sohealthinstitute.org or, um, yeah, I think you, I think many of you have my email. Um, anyway, thank you all so much for attending. Um, I look forward to seeing hopefully all of you, maybe more people, um, at the next, uh, at the next one, which is, um, in March on the second Friday of March. So, uh, thank you so much and have a lovely rest of your day.